the six timing touchstones because you have to be able to sit down with your players once a week, once a month, whatever it is for a player, you know, you know, each player, you'll have your own timetable probably with those players. But um, you need to be able to sit down with them and, and, and talk about this and, and, and for them to realize that this is not thinking too much. It's not thinking too much to, to figure out what problem they're having, okay? Um, you know, it's like trying to figure out your diet because all these things are automatic anyways. You've already worked them out so that they're automatic. You can do each one of these. If you can rehearse them, you can do them automatically. Um, and, and because you can do them automatically, thinking about it is simply identifying the system failure when it happens. Okay, so the six timing touchstones. Number one is the timing of the delivery. If, you're, if the player is, is um, getting caught up in the delivery, you have to just sit there and think about it. Honestly, you can do a test. One thing I do in front soft toss is I'll, I'll literally you know, grab the ball and, and uh, I'll, you know, go do a whole wind up like this and do it nice and slow and then, and then flip the ball. And generally, players can't even hit it. They literally cannot hit it if you, do, if you go like this and take your time and then flip it, as opposed to you know, coming up and just flipping it normal. And here's the thing, if, if, uh, if someone is synchronizing this, nice, easy, soft toss, then, then they should be able to actually hit the first one, the first one. So, so if you found out that they're getting all strung out in the delivery, if the delivery is giving them problem, the timing delivery, all right? All right, so it's the delivery. And, and basically when guys will have a problem with the delivery, it's more about um, their, their, well, first they're not able to hit the first one that you throw to them. Um, it's ridiculous if they can't because they should just filter everything except release. I mean, their, their mind should be synchronized up to release and not care. As a matter of fact, they should see everything as taking a long time until release because you know nothing matters until you get to write about a pitcher's not going to quick pitch a guy if he knows how to get into the box the right way if he knows how to if he's been watching the guy to see if he does quick pitch out of the stretch all right so timing the delivery of the timing is he getting caught up in the delivery number two is the timing release does the hitter does the hitter have or can you tell that he's synchronizing release? Is he synchronizing? Does he have the beat of release? I mean, you, you got to figure, does he have the beat? How much, how many times in his pregame do you see him over there snapping at release? I mean, it is, of course, you know that the, the single snap and the double snap do completely different jobs, but we'll get into that in the next one. Um, the next one has to do with the pregame as well. Um, so, in this timing touchstone, you know, you have to sit down with a player and go, listen, I, I don't see you working on this. I mean, as, as a college coach or a professional coach, you have their undivided attention. And, you, you know, you're working with them every day and you can tell if they're working on their timing. You can see them on the line if they're, going to, if they're watching the pitcher. If every player on that team isn't syncing up that pitch, and synchronizing the fall and, and shortening everything except the last part of the timeline, then you know that they're not working at it. But as far as the timing of release, you got to see if they're synchronizing the beat. Are, the, are they getting jumpy? And you know, a sign that they're, not, that they're not synchronizing the beat. Are they getting jumpy? If they're jumpy at all, are they getting strung out? If they're getting jumpy or strung out, you know that they don't have, they haven't synchronized release. And, there's, there's no do-overs, you know? There's, there's no do over There's no mulligans. You have to be able to visualize what's going on and do it on the first one. And we all know that, but, uh, you know, we went, oh, well, well, I need to see a pitch. No, you don't. You need to be able to learn how to figure out how to visualize the situation, to visualize the trajectories, 
I mean, you can do it soft toss. You, as a matter of fact, you don't even know you're doing it. Once again, you don't even know you're doing it. You walk up into the box and you don't even know what you have to do. You just simply find that you're managing all those things. And you just, in, in, in soft toss, in regular like three quarter soft toss, you tend to not do anything tr tricky. And it's a little closer than front soft toss. And so you don't do any planning, any pre-planning at all. And, uh, and so, you know, guys can generally, if they really focus, they can get it on the first shot. But um, anyways, make sure that they're getting synchronizing release. So that means, you know, are they paying attention before the game? Are you watching them synchronize and, and leaning to the speed? Are, you, are they watching the pitcher warm up? Are they doing some drills in their pregame? Can you see, you know, are they getting the job done? You know, it's how they go about their business. All right. Number three is the pitch timing, all right, is the pitch timing, okay, you're timing the pitch is the third thing, you got to figure out whether they're doing that, and it's kind of sound, sounds kind of silly, but really, you remember what the, what the first thing is about synchronizing the pitch, about feeling the speed of the pitch, is to find a distance. How do you find the distance? Well. Number one, you are synchronizing release, okay? You can tell if the guy's synchronized and release. And number two, has the guy rehearsed where contact is? Has he given a little tap, you know? Is he going like this? Is he, feel, is he feeling contact? Because that sets a distance, all right? So by setting that distance, you have, you're, you're setting point B and you have point A at release. I mean, just, just a guy, if he doesn't take the time to rehearse contact, I mean, what's he doing? Come on. Every time you hit a hammer, you go a little small, little tap, 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 whack, and then you hit it. You don't just, you know, set the nail and just hold the hand back like this and start smacking it. No, you take a, you know, you might do a little, you might go from just small taps to some bigger taps, or you might do small taps and get set and then kind of feel it for a second and then come back and whack, you know, but you're not just going to, you know, leave the area, right? You're gonna, you're gonna rehearse. You're gonna get closer. If you're doing a sledgehammer, same thing, you know? That, sle that sledgehammer, you're gonna go, okay, where is it? All right it's, right, it's right there, and then you're gonna go through the whole move, all right? So you gotta set, to get the pitch timing, you have to have a distance, all right? Now, you got the timing of the stride and transfer. That's the fourth one. The timing of the stride and transfer is part of your ride and stride. The first part of that ride and stride, in that ride and stride, synchronizing the time, I mean, this is the time, number four, timing the stride and transfer. Let's, let's make sure we have this. If it doesn't have blue on it, then you won't be able to learn anything. This blue is, is, is important. I'm kidding, obviously. Okay. By timing the stride and the transfer, what you're doing is you are making sure that you get inertia. You, you got to set your inertia. You don't have to go very far. As a matter of fact, there, there are some guys like an Utley or something like that, they, they barely go anywhere, right? Or you know, a lot of times they do a nose stride. But as long as you set, look, as long as I bring a little bit of inertia and bring my hands with me, if I bring my hands with me, just a tick, just a tick, and that's that ride, that ride, okay? So if I get my ride, coordinate my ride and my stride. Now, how do we do that? Well, remember the first thing you do to get to coordinate the stride and the transfer is to make a first move with the transfer. So you put some pressure on that hitter, you get in front of him, get in front of that guy, get in front of every one of your guys and get them in their stance and see if they can go slow and they can go slow from their stance and you're holding them back and they push into it, push into it and they go like that. Here it is, push into it. So the first move is pushing into it, okay? All right, here's what you do uh, with the player at first. You get in front of them and um, at first because they're, they're so used to reaching out first as opposed to um, letting themselves ride or freely or get into a position where they can freely ride and then fall free fall into position 
they reach without without being ready. So this gets them in a p- p- position where it gets them in a strong posture where their first movement, they're ready. And their first movement, they can go forward only. And so that ride is truly ready. And once you do that, you can go to the next step and, and do a whack-a-mole drill along with it. And I'll show you sometime. I mean, that's something as a coach, especially as a hitting coach, you got to make sure your guys are doing the right thing. I mean, because otherwise, look, what they've been doing, what they've been taught, they've been solving problems the wrong way. I mean, listen, uh, we've all done this. Look, the idea is we're learning these six timing touchstones because we have failed in, in teaching uh, you know, young players what they got to do. Why? Because we didn't know it in the first place. Okay? I was a natural timing hitter. Yet, I'm the first one to admit, when I was out front, when I got jumpy, I got, you know, guys would say, wait back, stay back. So what would I do? I would realize, well, I'd try to synchronize it up. I I guess I would try not to panic. And then I would try to sync it up the right way. And then if I couldn't sync it up, if I was getting frustrated, if I got, if I was, if I continued to be jumpy and strung out. I would try to literally physically stay back. And I remember trying to get in a position where I couldn't go forward. I mean, think of that adjustment. So that would be a scenario like this. You think you're waiting back, but really you're just putting yourself in a position where you're not ready. So you have to change your posture, get in a stronger position. What I'm teaching you guys is to learn how to handle the timing touchstones so you can be standing here free and be an athlete just like a pitcher is, you know, from the setup. He can just be an athlete and go home freely, you know. He he doesn't have to be mechanical and stay back here and read. No, he can just go forward, right? So as you see here, I'm putting myself in position where I can be ready, but going forward only, but I can draw it out and I, I, I take as much time as I need to synchronize release. Well, as a hitter, you know, what did this come from? It came from not coping with what you got to do. And you don't have to think of this as thinking and overthinking and overprocessing. You have to figure out where the system failure is and... And so back to the uh, story I was telling you, I remember trying to wait back, thinking, you know, listen, we're all trying to solve the problem. We're all trying to solve the problem of being jumpy, but no one has told us how to do it. No one told us. No one told me when I was younger. So I didn't know how, other than I would feel it later on, whether I was taking soft toss or whatever it was, because I knew in soft toss, I could just relax and commit because I, was, I just had it and I didn't really make the correlation. So what would I do? I would try to put my body in a position where I was like in a cast. I couldn't go forward if I wanted to. You know, I'm standing here like this. And so what is this doing? This is like being back so far and so awkwardly that what? Am I worried that I'm going to be jumpy within this, within the cast, within this thing, within the barrier that's not going to let me go and I'm going to be jumpy inside of it and it's not going to let me go and then all of a sudden it's going to let me go on time? Well, what's the mechanism that's going to let me go on time any more than the normal mechanism would let me go on time if I just was standing here and just, just and I decided to go on time? So why is waiting back arbitrarily, holding myself back arbitrarily, hopefully you know, what it is, is that it's this arbitrary hold yourself back until the guy gets through with his assholes and elbows and releases it. It's really getting through the timing of the delivery and the timing of the release. So if you can get through these two, okay, and you get through these two by holding yourself back, you know, and you got, you know, and the, the ball's on you. So the ball's on you and you end up fighting it off. Okay, well, you know, we have a better way of figuring this out, okay, which what we, you know, which is what I've taught you. But young players try to solve the problem incorrectly and it's not their fault. I did the same thing. And that's why it's time I blame myself for not getting the voice out, getting my voice out there and letting, play, letting players, letting coaches 
understand this because listen, everybody who's played this game, all you coaches have played this game, you've tried it and you've come to the conclusion it didn't work. You've come to the conclusion that there's no answer for it and no one talks about timing because nobody understands it. Because very, you know, very, they just, you either, it's just some sort of intangible, you either have it or you don't, but it's not the truth. It's not the truth. I mean, it is if no one talks about it, but it's, if we bring it up and we discuss this, now it opens up the field for other players who are talented and, uh, you know, I mean, all the different variables going on, you know, why is one player with the same ability able to, to break through this uh, without knowing these things and is able to break through and play in the big leagues? Well, you know, maybe certain, you know, certain abstract things go his way and he's able to figure it out. But, you know, uh, one thing I've seen players, what they do more than anything is they, is they have not coordinated their stride and transfer very well. That's why you give them a little, little shove and, you know, hold their front side. And they haven't coordinated that well enough. So they end up reaching an early stride and holding their foot out there and then getting jumpy or whatever they're doing. They're uncoordinated. They haven't coordinated. So what do they do? Well, they have to go to a tall and fall or a high leg kick. Well, what is a high leg kick? High leg kick is you're off early, so you lose control. As soon as you lift, you're, you're pretty much, you don't have as much control if, as if you keep your foot on the ground and do a, quote, high leg lift on the ground. If you have a little bit of contact with the ground, you can hold that ground a lot better, okay? So what happens is, is that you got guys who have no business with a high leg kick. High leg kick is reserved for, you know what, in my day, I remember, um, the guys who had a high leg kick, Ruben Sierra, Juan Gonzalez, that's about it. I mean, I mean, there were a few more guys, but there weren't many. And the only way you would do a high leg kick, I mean, because I, I could feel it. If I went into a high leg kick, it, it's a, it's a get, it's, you're vulnerable. Because as soon as you lift, I mean, you got to be able to hold yourself there and you got to know the technique. And, you know, you, you, you well, you, you're, you're guessing earlier in the guy's wind up when the feeling of it is to get up in the air instead of synchronizing release and making it easy. Okay, so, you know, I made the wrong choices, the wrong decisions, but your guys don't have to, and you can be a coach now who can teach natural timing because you have the answers. Okay, you have the answers, and, and you'll learn more about it. Next is the timing swing flow. All right, the swing flow. All right, I mean, so think about it. If you don't feel like, when you're hitting, if you don't feel like the bat is swinging itself, in other words, if you, listen, when, when you do like the walking drill and you're walking into it, and how, you know how the bat just feels like it's swinging itself when you're walking? So you walk into the ball, you walk into it, and wham! That just throws itself. Well, there's a big difference between that feeling where you're throwing the bat and getting up there. And I know you guys understand this because you've all tried it. Those of you, you know, hit, used to hit off the tee a lot. You put a ball on the tee and you're standing there, especially if you're a guy who doesn't get any transfer. You're standing there like this and then you swing and it feels like you're forcing it. You're like, man, that didn't feel right, you know? And if you look real closely, by the time you're hitting it, your arm, neither of your arms got straight, and you're already rolling over without your arms getting straight. You didn't force it because your arms, you never got inertia, and your arms never got extended because they didn't have enough energy and momentum to fire on their own on time. So you didn't have a good swing flow because you didn't start with inertia. So you got to swing as if you're doing a walking drill. That's why I have not seen a player, you know, uh, well, I don't want to go that far maybe necessarily, but most players, they do a version of a walking drill, especially when they get hot. When they get hot, they love that feeling. They just absolutely love that feeling of walking up like this. Or, you know, a lot, a lot of times they, they don't work it out where they can actually be open like this and cross like that because they haven't practiced it. And that'll be a drill that I show you. But, so they usually kind of stand close like this and then 
step and then cross over and hit. Okay, it's kind of it's kind of cheating, but well, it's not cheating, but it's just it's it's simplifying, and that's fine. But the the point is is that you have enough momentum, enough inertia, and as long as you have as long as long as the guy's throwing soft toss with good timing and they and they have some skill with it where they can throw it, you know, they can project where the kid's walking so that they can throw it consistently, which is important, all right? So swing flow is important that you feel like, you know, your arms are getting thrown, your arms are getting locked out, you know, your arms are getting fired and locked out where you can, you know, release and hit it and have a nice pretty swing, have a nice flow to it, all right? Okay, and finally you have you're timing the pitch with timing the swing. So in other words, you're synchronizing the pitch time with your swing time. You know, ultimately that's hitting. Synchronizing the pitch time with the swing time is hitting a baseball. And, you know, uh, you have to get your stride timing right. And then you have to connect the stride timing and the trans stride and transfer timing with your swing flow. Of course, all that has to connect so that you can have a repeatable swing. You have a repeatable swing, then you just you deal with synchronizing the pitch and then you're synchronizing the pitch time with the with the swing time. So you can discuss this with your guys. You can discuss this. So you know um, in the next uh, touchstone we're going to talk about some of, some of the drills that we can do. But but this is a touchstone where you sit down with your players and you talk about this and don't be afraid to. This is not overthinking. This is simply saying, okay, what am I doing? What are the variables that I'm not managing well? And how can I do a better job at, at reducing the variables so, so that I can hit better?